Well, good morning, everyone. We are glad that you are here with us. Um, things are going to look a little bit different this morning. Number one, we're excited because we have uh, Laura Meyer leading us in worship. So we're excited about that. Um, and of course, we have someone who's new at leading worship. So all of our tech stuff went down. Um, and so uh, we had to rearrange some instrument stuff. And so, but the band uh, rolled with it and worship is going great. And so we're excited for that this morning. But just to give you a heads up, um, the music won't be coming out of the actual system. And so if you're on the live stream with us this morning, uh, it's going to sound a little bit different too. And so I uh, just wanted to give a heads up on that. Um, we're working through some of those kinks this morning. Um, but we also this morning have a guest speaker um, in Mike Shragi from Good News Productions International. Uh, and so we're super excited about that. Uh, hopefully you were able to catch uh, him talking a little bit during the Sunday school hour. Um, and I know he's going to talk a little bit more about uh, GNPI uh, during his message and stuff today. So um, we're excited to have him with us this morning and to hear about what's going on with them and uh, what they're doing um, across the world. And so um, we were able to learn a little bit about them at CIY this summer as CIY was supporting them. and. Uh, we got to watch one of their new movies that just came out, uh, which the students loved, and, and it was a great experience for them, and so we're excited for that. Um, I have a couple of announcements this morning before we get rolling into worship. Uh, if you're a first-time guest with us, if you would do me a favor and grab a Connect card um, out of the chair in front of you, uh, and you can find me after service, and I'd love to get that from you, and that's just a way for us to get some information uh, so we can get you some information about the church and who we are and, and uh, get you connected with what's going on here. And those can also be used as prayer requests. So if you have anything that you would like prayers for, um, fill those out, and we would love to pray for you this morning, get it on the prayer chain, pray for you throughout the week. Um, the other big announcement that we still have going on is our Fall Fest, which is coming up October 29th um, from 4 to 6. We're excited for this. It's going to be a great uh, afternoon slash evening. Um, and so we're going to have pony rides and a petting zoo. Uh, we're going to have crafts and food. It's going to be a ton of fun. Um, and then following um, that, uh, the city is having a trunk or treat. Um, right after we're done down Main Street. And so you can go and participate in that, and it's going to be a ton of fun. Um, and so uh, with that, we are collecting candy. And so if you would like to donate some candy, we've got the barrel out there in the foyer. Uh, you can bring some in. We'd love to do that because we're going to um, you know, do a candy drop like we do um, in, in the past for that event, and it's going to be a ton of fun. And so uh, with all that being said, let me go ahead and uh, start us off with a word of prayer before we get to singing. Uh, dear God, we thank you uh, so much uh, for uh, this morning. Uh, we thank you that, you know, no matter what tech issues that we might run into, uh, we can still worship you. Uh, we can still praise you. We can still come to you and give you the glory that you deserve, God. And so help us do that this morning. Uh, it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Will you please stand and worship with us this morning? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me
Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. We made it through. <laughs> you can take this time to greet each other.
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in me No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Uh, 
this time, uh, every Sunday, we uh, set aside for communion. It is something that uh, God has instituted for his uh, church to do. And it is to remember Jesus and what he has uh, done for us. And there are several of us that uh, rotate uh, doing this um, on Sundays. Uh, Larry and Steve and Bryce and Jed and Tom and uh, myself and Doc and several uh, do this. And the purpose is to um, help us all focus on, again, what Jesus has done uh, for us, his death, burial, and resurrection, and to evaluate our relationship uh, with him. And we use uh, scripture uh, that talks about uh, sacrifice or forgiveness, uh, grace, and sin. Um, and it's a, a difficult thing to do to, to take on that responsibility to get you focused on, on Jesus. Um, we also go to places on uh, the internet like Sermon Central and we get illustrations and ideas on how we uh, can do that. Uh, we find uh, stories. And those stories talk about uh, God's calling uh, and what he wants us uh, to do. Um, faith and hope uh, and love, uh, God's power and even death. Uh, we also uh, look back at our personal experiences and how God has worked in our life and we share them to hopefully help you uh, connect uh, with God uh, through uh, this time. And <clears throat> sometimes we might uh, hit a chord with you and um, connect with you and help you in this connection to God and what Jesus has done. Other times you might think, Dave, you missed the mark. What in the world are you talking about? Um, and that's why it's so difficult uh, because we don't want to miss that connection with, with anyone. Um, <clears throat> there's a movie uh, that just came out and I wish that we could take the time right now to watch this movie because it will prepare you for communion time. And uh, the movie is playing right now in Onwa at the theater, and it's called The Hill. Uh, Nancy and I saw it last night, and it's an amazing movie. It's about uh, a family and a church and baseball. Uh, and don't let baseball scare you if you don't like baseball. There's not a whole lot of baseball in it. But it will strike a chord with you no matter where you are at in your relationship uh, with God. It talks about all the terms I just used, uh, forgiveness and faith and hope and love and death, sacrifice, determination, discipline, on and on, it touches on all those things. Um, had me in tears at times. Uh, it's a must see because it will help you connect with Jesus. And that's what we wanna do right now is connect with Jesus and remember, remember what he has done uh, for us. Um, the 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 tragedy that he, he went through, the pain he went through um, uh, for us. And uh, that's why God has set this time apart for his church to commune uh, with him and remember Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, um, his broken body, his shed blood. And as we pray and as we uh, partake, 
um, focus on him with all your heart and with all your mind. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we uh, thank you so much for uh, your church, uh, a place that we can come and find refuge, a place for uh, peace, uh, a place uh, for healing, uh, a place that we can come and just um, uh, worship you and thank you for uh, the miraculous things that uh, you have done uh, for us. Uh, we thank you for Jesus and, and how you have uh, expressed your love for us through him. Uh, I pray, Lord, that um, you would clear our minds of uh, the things that would distract us from focusing on you, uh, that you would help us see uh, Jesus. Thank you for your love, and we pray these things in his name. Amen. Let's pray for our uh, offering this morning. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we just uh, thank you for the way that uh, you uh, bless us uh, each and every day. Uh, we thank you for um, the facilities that you have provided for us uh, where we can come and, and worship you and, and uh, sing praises to you and preach the gospel of your son Jesus. We thank you for um, Good News Productions and uh, their ability to uh, reach people throughout the world and um, the way that uh, we uh, share in their uh, ministry. We thank you for the generosity of this, of this church and and the, the individuals that have a, a desire to see your word spread. I pray that uh, you would um, uh, bless them uh, with their endeavors. Uh, use uh, the money wisely. Help us to use the money wisely. That um, um, our uh, objective would be uh, to help uh, people throughout the world know your son Jesus and the joy that uh, he brings, the salvation uh, that he, he brings to each and every one of us. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. For almost half a century, GMPI has been creating media and sharing Jesus. <clears throat> From solar kits to social media, the gospel message has been on the move around the world. Because of people like you, the ministry is now 27 teams strong in 16 countries. And with the inauguration of Nomad Academy, 
a new generation of media makers receive training to create media and share the good news. In India, Hindi Church Online reaches hundreds of thousands of viewers per week. Projects like the Global Gospel and Amazing Stories connect with children and adults alike in their own heart languages. In fact, GMPI teams engaged over 52 million with the good news last year. But with billions still waiting, we must do more. So, where do we go from here? Mission 15. GMPI teams and partners are united around the goal of offering 1 billion gospel invitations by the end of 2030. But we need you to join us to reach this goal. It's easy. Simply pray, give, and share. You can pray for Mission 15 and that people all around the world will hear the good news. You can give $15 one time or regularly. With every $15 given, 450 gospel invitations will go out. Just imagine the impact you can have over a year. And you can share with others how they too can be a part of sharing Jesus around the world. Do you know family or friends who could join you on this Mission 15 journey? By the power of the Holy Spirit and your partnership, we at GMPI believe this audacious goal is attainable to send 1 billion invitations to follow Jesus by the end of 2030. Will you join the movement? Morning. How is the church here in Whiting? We good? Good. My name is Mike Schrage, and uh, I serve as president of GMPI, Good News Productions International. And just wanted to share just a little bit uh, to write, kind of tidy up first uh, your partnership with GMPI. First of all, you have walked with us, partnered with us, coming close to 50 years. And for that, we want to say thank you. You've also given almost $140,000 of invested offerings into this ministry alone. And I think that shows a great hand of support, not just for what you want to do in being grateful to God for how he supplied you and sustained you throughout the years, but a giving heart that says we still are interested in our community, we're interested in our state, in our nation, and in our world, and we want to use missions like GNPI to tell that story of Jesus to people that we may never get to see. And in languages, we may never get to speak, and in countries, we may never get to visit. And yet, because they are made in the image and likeness of God, that Hindu, that Muslim, that Buddhist is just as important as we are here in America. That's the kind of sense of heart that I get from you at Whiting, and for that, I want to honor you and want to thank you very much. So from all of our hundred-some staff, thank you from around the world. From our 10 or 12, rather, staff in Joplin, thank you as well. I got to serve as a missionary for 20 years, uh, enjoyed teaching and preaching, but today I, as president of GMPI, really believe that while I don't get to do what my first desire was, is have a cup of tea and talk about Jesus under an acacia tree in Kenya, I do get to do that through the proxy of media and letting lots and lots and hundreds of other brothers and sisters do that, and they have the tools to let them be effective in their communicating. So if you have other questions, please see me after the service. There is a sign-up sheet for you to get more involved in Mission 15 particularly. I really am excited about this seven-year goal of a billion new invitations of the gospel of Jesus being offered. That's a thousand million. That's, as I said in Sunday school, if you are a million seconds old, you're 11 days old. If you are a billion seconds old, you're 31 years old. Big difference. And we have 8 billion people, 6 billion in our planet who still don't know who Jesus is, unlike you and me. So there's a big world, there's a big work, there's a big need out there, and media really helps us meet it. So thank you for that little bit of plug. Do check out GMPI, go to our website, take some materials home with you, sign up, and continue to pray for us, particularly for Mission 15. If you have, hello again to everyone online, uh, as well as you here, if you have your digital devices or you have your Bible, please turn to me uh, as we talk about today well, a message I've entitled, The Zone, The Hidden Treasure from Matthew 13, In the Zone. 
And so this isn't going to be the end zone with, I know, football season here and so forth, but we're going to unpack what the zone means here in the next couple of minutes. But if you have your devices, you have your Bible, basically there's this short little nugget of the parable that's sandwiched between, in Matthew 13, six different parables. This one in the lineup is number four, and it's one sentence, and it's very short. And it basically says the kingdom of heaven. And a lot of times the parables are used by Jesus to communicate a heavenly idea in an earthly sense. In something that we as humans experience every day. And so he takes this and he's talking about, again, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. They're interchangeable at times in the New Testament. And so he says the kingdom of heaven here is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in joy sold all that he had and purchased or bought that field. Wow. Now, let's get the first things first. Who's the treasure? One name, one word, one person. His name is Jesus. All right. So he's the treasure. He's talking about himself here. It says, the kingdom of God in a word is me. I am the kingdom. I'm that person of value. But as we unpack that and we see that there is a lot here to continue to see in the lineup of these very punch-packed parables that we see that Jesus is going to be sharing, and particularly this one here in the fourth in that sixth lineup, and that is about the kingdom of heaven. Now, I, years ago, was driving along in West Texas, and there is not a lot out there. Anyone been in West Texas? Driving through there? Let's see a couple of hands. You're going there and there's one cow for every 20 acres. I mean, you can drive off, fall asleep and drive off and there's no ditch. You just go ahead and drive in somebody's farm. I mean, there's, there, it's so flat, it's so dry, there's so nothing out there. And so you're going ahead, man, who would ever want to live out here, much less say that we're going to try to make a farming and a lifestyle out here. This is scrub brush and worthless. And then there's that little bitty metal thing out there that's levering and going, ee, 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 ee. And it's doing this thing and making money every stroke. And what is it? Oil. There's oil in them there hills, partner. And so you see that while there's nothing above ground, there's all this worth and value underground. And so it's the same kind of idea there. Why would I want to buy that West Texas sagebrush and worthlessness and so forth is because there is going to be with those oil rights a lot of value think of it in that sense of the parable of what jesus is talking about here as we think about the value of this treasure now as we unpack it in a big idea kind of way what i want you to see is that jesus is really interested in me today being totally sold out and as a result living a transformed life now don't miss that to live it now knowing he will offer eternity in heaven for me as well this is what it is people here's the takeaway Jesus, when you accept Him as Lord and Savior, the coupon, the promise, the covenant between the living God and you and me for heaven is in your pocket. It's in your purse. That is done. That is given. What He's worried about is how you're going to be living and transformed from this moment on with me, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, your brother and your God. So he gives these parables, the kingdom of heaven will be like, the kingdom of God will be like. And in this one, in number four in the lineup, it talks about a treasure. And so people, he's really, for a couple of minutes, we want to camp in on this idea of how he wants me to live here in Whiting now as a follower of Jesus. The heaven, that's already done. Isn't that wonderful and good of God? Heaven for eternity, that coupon is already done. It's paid. It's there, and it's waiting for you and me. What he is concerned about is how we in Whiting live now. 
That is where the transformation happens. That is what he's really wanting to look at. And so as we look at, we see this lineup of different uh, parables and so forth. And there's basically, with this one is number four, we see that uh, it's just that one line, that it's a treasure. And the man came along, and in some narratives it says that he may have been a trespasser. Really wasn't even supposed to be alone that way, or it wasn't, he was kind of trespassing. And so either way, he comes across this treasure, and interesting, what two things does he do? First thing, do you remember? Hand up. What does he do? Hides it. Now, <laughs> you go, that's a little bit conceited and selfish and a little bit and so forth, then he hides it. And the second thing, he goes ahead, and what does he do? He decides to sell everything everything. Now, what does everything mean? Everything. <laughs> and he goes ahead and does it with, what's the narrative here? With joy. With joy, he's releasing everything else that he owns. How much? We have no idea. In order to see this treasure. Because he's discovered that it surpasses everything he could imagine at that point in his life. And so, that's the story. That's the narrative. And so I want to just back up just a little bit and ask you and me, can you remember, go to a time in your own life as maybe a, a 16-year-old young man, and you're getting your driver's license, and it's that first pickup, that first car. Oh, I remember mine. It was a 66 Chevelle Candy Apple Red convertible Super Sport that had a 396 Holly 4 barrel. Well, that's for another day. But I remember working in bucking bales, being a farm kid, handling bales and working in construction so I could get the money so I could have that car. It was my first real earthly treasure. Any other guys in there like this? Anyone else do that? Or maybe for you it was a newlywed couple. When we first got married and so forth and moved out of Joplin into Hayes, Kansas, we had an upstairs apartment, and we are six foot tall, me and my wife, and so we went ahead, and it was on an attic, it was up in the attic, and you banged your head when you took a bath and shower, and you banged your head when you were cooking. It was one itty-bitty little apartment. The AC didn't work. It was hot during the summer, cold in the winter. And oh, we were so glad when we could afford something better. And for maybe that was you to scrimp and to save so that you could have that down payment for that first house. Maybe that was your selling it all in your treasure. Or maybe you were that entrepreneur. That's all that, man, there's a franchise here that I can get in with Chick-fil-A or some other business and so forth. And so you're working two jobs and you're doing all the saving that you can so that you and your wife together, and maybe with a brother-in-law and his wife and so forth, you're putting all that money down so you can have that new startup business that's yours. I don't know what it is, but in all three of those cases, there's this illustration, there's this feeling, there's this emo provocative emotion that says, I am all in to get the car, to have the house, to drive the business. And that's the kind of feeling that Jesus wants us to get here in this short but power-packed parable. Of when he came across that treasure he was all in and so as we look at this a little bit further we hear the narrative of just our own lives and so forth but i don't want us to also understand that when jesus is teaching parables and when he's talking about it, and i'll tie this in a minute back to what we do at ministry of gmpi and, and and being in the zone but you know he's teaching about the kingdom of heaven first and foremost and he he does tell us that you know, in the kingdom, and there's all kinds of teaching about the kingdom of heaven, about heaven itself, from parables that Jesus speaks about, of course. He talks about the fact that I am there, Jesus, preparing a place for you. Imagine. Again, I worked in construction for some years, putting myself both as a finished up high school and into college days, and it is a lot of blueprint and carpenter work into preparing a dwelling that we call a house. Jesus is building your 
house, customized for you. Isn't that amazing? There's parables that teach us about that in the kingdom of heaven. Other things that tell us about the kingdom, it says that there's going to be a different kind of state of being. There will no longer be those who are married and those who are divorced. It's a different spiritual realm altogether. So there's preparation of home. There's different spiritual nuancing of how we will live in heaven. And then he goes on to tell us even, and oh, by the way, there's this big chasm. Remember that story? There's this big separation between heaven and hell, between where God is and where Satan resides. And those are just three principles, three truths that we hear from the parables about and from the mouth of Jesus about the kingdom of heaven. Now let us turn our case and talk about a little bit about the kingdom of God here on earth. Now, among us as human beings, there we see other points that says, for example, in my kingdom on earth, the first shall be last, and the last are going to be first. That's just how we do things in my kingdom. Also, he talks about the fact that in my kingdom, obedience is key. And it will not be according to Matthew 7, 7, everyone who says, Lord, Lord, that will enter into my Father's rest or into the kingdom of heaven. But it is he who does what? The will of my Father. Obedience-based. Transformative obedience is what he's after. So, there's this dynamic of who will be first and who will be last and who is recognized and who is not. There's this element of obedience and transformatively what is happening. All about the kingdom of living here in Whiting now as a Christian. We also see that the Magna Carta of the kingdom is really what we call in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 the Beatitudes, right? And we see there the different ways that Jesus narratively tells that people in the kingdom are going to live. And so he describes in long detail. It's his most fabulous sermon. And he told it over and over, they believe. So much so that the writers would use many of words to describe what Jesus is describing as kingdom of God among us. And so we see that these parables are teaching a heavenly principle about, yes, we have the coupon, we have heaven, but we also are to be living transformatively and being different as we are small Jesuses among the people we live and work among. You know, in my wanting to be a passionate follower of Jesus, a disciple maker, a preacher, a missionary, there's so many times, and maybe you're like me in this regard, there's so many times I, I want to rush into the point, of, I want them to accept Jesus, and I want them to have heaven. And that's not wrong. But in that wanting that, I jump over to the fact that Jesus wants to walk with that person moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour, year by year, and transformatively have a relationship. And I jump over that to get him to heaven, and we're, Jesus is going, whoa, whoa, time out, Mike, time out. What about tonight? What about tomorrow? What about next week? Because I, Jesus, the King of Kings, I so yearn to just walk with this person made in my image. And yes, he will have heaven. She will get that throne. She will get that part of the treasure. But there is treasure to be had by living with him now as well. Recently, we were doing some remodeling work, and I intentionally invited a man to come and do some remodeling and handyman work who has been a recovering alcoholic. And he said something that I actually quickly wrote down, and I want to share it with you. Mike, the past seven months of being in AA have been so good that it has wiped out 30 years of depression and addiction. 
It's like there was the seven years of famine for me first, and now, Mike, the seven years of plenty. I now live daily asking Jesus, what do you want me to learn? Do you hear that man's heart? When's the last time you paused in your busy life and had a conversation with Jesus that says, Jesus, here's your book. Talk to me. Better yet, Jesus, here's my heart. Talk to me. Jesus, walk with me. That's the part of the parable of the treasure that I think we too often skip and run across. That's the part that I really think he wants us to understand. You know, in Henry Blackaby, has anyone been through his books that were called Experiencing? There's a few in the audience. Experiencing God. It basically, the principle there is, is to identify where and to see where God is working and is present, and just simply join him there. But that takes some courage, it takes boldness, it takes discernment to, to, and time to do that. See where God is in your life and join him there. And so I'd, I'd ask reflectively for a moment, if I was to ask you right now to write on a piece of paper or text me, where do you think God is working in your life? with your relationships, where would that be? And the second question to follow up that would be, are you there with Him in it? Are you so sold out with the treasure you realize that's the treasure? That walking with Jesus thing? That's the treasure. That's the thing He wanted me to grab onto with the Kingdom of God idea right now. Now, if we are to have this journey of experience and transformation, we have to be excited about the fact that Jesus says this. And we quote it all the time in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 about the Great Commission, you know, and about how we are to go into all the world and so forth. But we miss the la many times the end of that, which is a wonderful punctuated promise where he says, and I am with you always. Now, that with you point is where I want us to talk get into in the zone. I want to be honest with you that um, I am not a good athlete. <laughs> You're going, well, look at the body, dude. No wonder. We're not surprised. What else do you want to tell us? But I, I don't know what got into my mind, but I played basketball and did fair at shortstop, and I played, uh, our, our, well, there you go, played basketball and played shortstop, right? So, played baseball and played shortstop and played basketball and was kind of like a sixth guy, all right? But one year, I don't know why it got into me, but I decided to run cross country. Anybody done that, run cross country? You poor soul. It is not for those who want any kind of fan base. Because you get up, right? You get up and you just put those shoes on and run. And you run, and there's nobody to say how you're doing, except for the coach who at the end is clocking you and say, why are you that slow again? Other than that, you're up the hills and down the hills, and in the morning and in the dark, and you're running on your own. And so we did, and I did cross country for that one, one year. <laughs> I, I was cured after that. I never did that again. But in that year, one of the things that I heard from other more veteran runners, and I did have the opportunity to run one time against a qualifying Olympiad, who from Lebanon, Illinois, when we were running our three and a half mile track, he went ahead and lapped people. He was that fast. I dove to the finish line so I wouldn't be one of them. That tells you how slow I am. He was lapping. So anyway, 
I'm going ahead and I hear the story from people like this gen gentleman that in the running, there are times, and I don't know, you had your hand up. I don't know if there's several. Other. Did you ever hit a time where you were running and you just felt like, wow, I can do this? I mean, it's like the breathing is just so methodical and brings in so much oxygen, and you can run and go up that hill, and it just is not that difficult. And you're just clocking it away, and you go, I got this. I mean, I'm going to set world records here. I mean, you're in a zone. You ever feel that? It comes. It's a euphoric feeling as an athlete. And it's not just in running. There's others that will feel and be in the zone as well. It may be as a hitter. That in baseball, there are batters who say that when they really get into the zone, they literally can see a 95-mile-an-hour fastball and see its rotations and the stitching on that ball. They're that locked in, and that's why they're a 300-hitter. They're in the zone. Or it may be a Ferrari driver. My son loves watching Ferrari races and so forth. And they talk about there the men who are the fastest at their craft and driving and so forth. That when they're in the zone, they can so see everything at 200 miles an hour. Everything slows down to where those hairpin corners they can just see them and with the slightest adjustment at 200 miles an hour they're hugging that curve and shaving off that quarter of a second because they're in the zone running hitting driving all physical activities and we talk about being in the zone it was a heightened awareness that allowed their physical capacity to be maximized. Now let's apply that to your life and me, spiritually. Do you, have you experienced being in the zone with Jesus? I want to share two examples with you real quickly. One of them is when I was president of a mission conference, and it was called ICOM, International Conference on Missions, it was a big responsibility, a volunteer role, but a big responsibility in Lexington, Kentucky. They'll have between, I don't know, five and 6,000 individuals, and I wanted to do a really good job. And so I promised myself, and I did this, that for one year up to November 2016, I, when I went to my, grab my coffee cup and had my Bible and had my quiet time in my study, in my house, I said, for one year, I'm going to covenant, I'm going to promise Jesus, in my recliner, I will not sit in that recliner during my quiet time. I will sit in a folding chair or on the carpet. You are king. You are have the recliner. You are boss. You are the one. And so for a year I did that. And can I tell you, it was the sweetest time of my life. It was not because I enjoyed sitting on a folding chair or on the ground. It was an intentional ascent of saying, You are Lord. You deserve my everything. You deserve sitting in that recliner. You deserve my every life. You deserve everything. And when I said that, and when I did that, He put me in the zone. And some of the things they say that 10 years later that happened at that conference are still reverberating because of some of the ideas. It wasn't Mike. It was the Lord Jesus using Mike. Because he was in the zone. More recently, we had a prayer day and fasting day at GNPI. And during that 24-hour period, we asked that people pray and fast around the world who knew our network at 15-minute integrals. And I had, as the president that day walked out, and at 5.05, asked my assistant, Adam, I said, Adam, is every 15-minute slot covered for our beginning at midnight of the 24-hour prayer vigil? And he said, yeah, they're all covered multiple times except for one. Dang it, I had to ask. 
Uh, you know when it was? 1.30 in the morning. Really, God. <laughs> okay, so you're a leader. What do you got to do? Uh, that's mine. <laughs> now, I had already signed up, to be honest, for one at 5 o'clock, which is already, I think, I'm not a spiritual guy, really. I'm not a prayer warrior, honestly. And yet, I had promised to get up at 5 in the morning, patting myself on the back. I'm going to pray from 5 to 5.15. Now, I know that at 1.30 in the morning, central time, it is also not covered and vacant. And so, <laughs> being the non-spiritual guy that I am, I made an agreement with God. Mistake. I said to him, God, if you want me to pray, as if, yeah, right, God doesn't want me to pray. God, if you want me to pray, I'm not going to set an alarm. You're going to have to wake me up at 1.30. Mistake. Do you know what happened at 1.20? I woke up with a horrific leg cramp in my left leg. I go to the bathroom, I'm walking it off, and I finally get back to my clock, and it's now 1.25. I'm still not spiritual. I'm complaining because of a leg cramp. And I look at the clock, and I'm going, oh, got it, God. And so at 1.30, I went into that room with the recliner, and we had a 15-minute prayer guide video, and I started to pray for what God wanted us to do at ministry at GMPI. And I did it 15 minutes, and 15 minutes went like that, and I did it another 15 minutes, and it went like that, and I was soon almost at an hour, and the whole vision of Mission 15 came during that time. A time when I was in the zone. And so I want to invite you to consider the fact that this parable about the treasure is, yes, it's about the kingdom of heaven and the coupon that we will have and the promise from Almighty God of living with Him forever. That is a given. What He wants to work on us is the transformative journey now, today, and tomorrow. And he would love to see that intersection when heaven and earth connect in your body, in your heart, in your work, in your life, in your ministry, I dare say, and get you in the zone. In that moment, the gates of hell do not win against you. In that moment, you are more faithful and more fruitful and more effective for the kingdom of God than at any other point in your life. In closing, I want to offer two things. Number one is that when he talks about the difficulty of rich people getting into heaven, I want us to apply it. Number one, to remember we are those rich people. If we make even minimum wage in this country, you are in the 90th percentile of income that you make a month than anywhere in the world. Think of that. As a minimum wage earner, yes, a high school kid at Sonic or McDonald's, you make in that time period more than 90% of the people on the planet. We have to wear the name rich man. Secondly, as a rich man, we need to understand <clears throat> that when we are rich and when we can have all of these things, which I love them and they're not to be discounted. I want us to understand that, however, when life is dangerous, when it is depressing, when it is disease-filled, when it is disastrous, it is then in our lives that we seek Jesus to help us here and now. And we look for Him. We look for His guidance. We look for His help. We look for His being present in the moment. And it is that point that Jesus says, I've got you. You're looking for the treasure. And at that point, we realize we are not so rich. We are not so self-producing and providing and sustaining. We need Him. What a blessing, then, that danger 
and disease and disasters and depression are as it shakes us up as the rich man and sees we've got to have that treasure. We've got to sell it all. We've got to be in and all in for him. And an example in closing of a person who was all in is a person by the name, historically, years and years ago, whose name was Wilberforce. Anyone know that name or know that story? Wilberforce, he was a British guy. He was very wealthy, inherited a lot of his money, and was becoming very aware that his companies were making a lot of money because of slavery. And so he decided to dismantle slavery, speak against it, all the time people saying, you're actually going to tear down the very empire, business-wise, that your father has built for you. And there were three things that Wilberforce decided very early on. Number one, that every person was created into the image and likeness of God, regardless of slave or free, color of skin, Irregardless, they were made in the image of God. So there was an intrinsic value that slavery violated. Number two, he believed that his resources were to be used by God and for him to be in the zone, so to speak, and to understand that his resources were under his guise and under his direction and under his stewardship to be used for the purposes of God and not himself. Not to be saved and to be passed on to his children, but to be used in the moment to make the most of the kingdom of God. And thirdly, he realized that his actions of his life would be his legacy. That the actions of his life would outlive him. Number one, people were valuable. Number two, resources were expendable to be stewarded. And number three, what I do with my life and those riches will be my legacy. He then became a person totally enveloped in the zone against the abolition of slavery and was single-handedly attributed in Europe as being the person who did that. Isn't that amazing what one man can do? when transformed by the image of the living God. And I believe that he understood from Matthew 13, verse 44, that Jesus was that treasure. Jesus was that one that was so worth me selling everything in joy so that I could have I thank you for what you do with GMPI, and I thank you for supporting and allowing me to have fun at doing a job that brings the treasure in front of people every day somewhere in the world. Thank you for that. But I do want you to also experience it yourself. And I really believe that Mission 15 will be one of those ways it can put you in the zone as you pray for lost people, as you maybe financially give to present good news to lost people, and eventually actually share yourself and your story with your neighbors and family who are lost people. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the 140,000 you've invested. Thank you for your love for Jesus. And may God put you in the zone this week as you invite him to sit in your recliner, sit in your spot, walk in his steps. And as we remember, heaven's already given. It's what he wants to know what we're going to do now. Are we going to be little Jesuses? Are we going to be little Wilberforces? And use his force for good in the world that has so much evil. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would accept our thanks from GMPI for this congregation who has journeyed with us for so many decades. And I thank you for their generosity in that journey as well. 
That meant not just giving of money, but of praying, and even in some cases visiting our offices in Joplin and other offices in Mexico and beyond. And Father, would you continue to bless the leadership of this congregation as they strive in ways to put this church in the zone, in a posture and position of walking moment by moment and joining where you're working, God, and going with you in it and understanding that you, Lord Jesus, are the most valuable, treasured thing that we could ever imagine and that you are worth everything we could offer to you of our 4 k of our homes, of our endeavors, of our journeys, of our savings. It's all yours. And in the process of learning and walking and turning it over to you, you will do some remarkable things in blessing and using us. And that is what we want as we live in the zone of a transformed life with Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Will you please stand and sing this last song with us? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar the father's arms are open why forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ has risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ has risen. 
bow down before him for he is lord of all sing hallelujah christ is risen oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining with us this morning, church. Uh, can we hear it for Laura and the band for fighting through those technical difficulties this morning? They did a great job. Yes. And so, uh, tell Laura she did great, because she did, and she needs to hear that. So, um, and so, uh, first time leading, and of course, you know, all the things can go wrong. But um, she did great, and we thank uh, Mike for being here this morning, and, and we hope you get to touch base with him, learn some more about GNPI and what they're doing. Um, but uh, we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for coming. <laughs>